Hi guys, how's it? The power just came back as I was starting to chat. <sighs> yeah, now they're slapping us with power cuts at like arbitrary times, but this is not about these power cuts. I actually want to switch that light off because I think things look better when it was off. I don't know. Um, okay, let me just get up and do it. Hi, I'm back. What's up? Um, yeah, did let you guys know that I prefer natural lighting. Uh, yeah, anyway. So... There is a lot on my mind, and we shall get it out. No, actually, is there? Hmm. All right. Yo, uh, things are bad. I did not, did not want to record today because the last videos that I did, video, the recordings that I did, I basically recorded all day long, and it took nine parts, and I'm still editing them. Those nine parts, I'm still publishing them. This, I'm still running them through software, um, my movie editing software, etc. And I have, therefore, I'm, they're not yet on YouTube. And when I'm that, when I'm backlogged, I just, I, I calm down, I chill, I don't do anything until I can catch up. But uh, nothing conquers what I'm feeling. Nothing overwhelms these, this heart, this sorrow. And then coming here to chat. You know, guys, when I was working at MTN, the former organization that I was at, is it better when I put it up here? Is that better? Ugh, I just, I don't like you guys be seeing the back there. I, I just, I, I really don't. I don't like this environment, but you know, it's all I have. Anyway, whatever. When I was working for the former company that I was, the last company that I ever worked for in my life, because South Africa has sought for to kick me out of gainful employment and then treat me like I'm the scum of the earth afterwards. When I was working there, there was this colleague. You know guys, there are some people in this world that, you know, you try, you really try. But I come big, nothing comes together. Uh, because they, they just carry this, um, they're, they're mean. They're mean. And even when you try to talk to them, when you try to be friendly for the day, when you try to even do a gesture, something nice for them, they just don't barge. They don't barge. And their, dis their dislike of you is uncalled for. It's entirely unwarranted. It's gratuitous. You don't know where it's coming from. You literally cannot do the mathematics. And so after some time, you just kind and let them be fly like the awkward bird you are in the sky in your separate portion of the sky and then I will fly like the bird that I am in the sky in the separate portion of the sky that I populate this woman was she was like bitter gall she was like a sour lemon that is also going off now a lemon is, is sour by nature but fruit also well they get bruises on them there comes a time when it's not healthy to try and eat a fruit anymore shrivels up you know this chick was both that she was like a sour fruit that's also going on and i thought that perhaps maybe the problem was me and yes it was that's just the thing but it wasn't just me i wasn't the only person that had a very difficult time getting on with this female now a person is not to be alone it's written in god's word that he does not make man to be alone uh, it's not good for man to be alone therefore he will make a helper suitable for him so god created eve for the very purpose of making sure that adam does not spend the rest of his life alone However, when an individual is a certain way, it's like they are a curse upon themselves. They are a law upon them on themselves. They are their own judgment because they make sure that they can have no one. They see fit to it that nobody can suffer them long because frankly they are insufferable. Well, I had I guess fellow other colleagues with, the, we, with whom I similarly agreed we similarly agreed that hey this chick man I try like I try she was very uh she had a, an aloof co an aloof constitution about her when she walked around very very serious about just about everything that's okay do you um but every so often she would be it's it's almost like on my terms yeah she had a whole on my terms personality or attitude in that only when she feels like it shall we all then get along only when she's in the mood will she laugh at the top of her voice she had very boisterous laughter the only thing about her really frankly that was pleasant um, but it was on her terms and so you never really knew what side of the bed she would wake up on and so therefore what 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 your reaction to her for the day ought to be people like those are avoidable so one morning she would hi girl with this big big smile and that boisterous laughter of hers and you'd be like hey 
Rinelue, let's say that was her name. Hey, Rinelue, how are you? Ah, oh, good. But even when you're talking with her, you're scared because you don't know what you might say that could trigger that sourness of hers that is also deteriorating since she's like a lemon that's also an inedible. She would be happy one day and then the next day you greet. I mean, it's just decent, especially among black people. We don't just walk into a room and like, that's it. If there are people there, we greet. But after greeting, you just kind of leave it at that. You don't ask, so how was your day or your morning or your evening? If it's morning time, you don't ask, so did your dog come right at the vet? So did you finally get around to baking that bread that you were experimenting with? Because, you know, yeah, it's like just basic small talk. You don't know whether to engage in small talk with her or not because you don't know what attitude you're going to receive. So when you greet, that's when you know what you're dealing with. One morning, it's, hi girl, how are you? The next morning, it's, hi. You would think you did something to her. I tried with this woman and just like an it all just fell through. All right? Like I said, I thought I was the only one because every so often you meet people that just don't gel with you. Your energies don't connect or whatever you want to call that thing. But I had other colleagues with whom we all were just like, I don't know how to deal with her. I, I literally, I don't know what I'm going to be getting for the day with her. I'm not really sure. However, strangely, she had people that she was consistent with. And you could name them on your one hand, right? But I, I, I often wondered, what is it about those people with whom she is consistent? consistent what 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 do they do that makes them accommodatable appropriate what is it that these people have that the rest of us fall short concerning what what is this woman's selection criteria for her to be consistent with you for her to consider you a friend and for her to maintain right or die state to you or loyalty or any kind of like you know good favorable like treatment of your person pers consistently not just for today and then tomorrow you're some kind of like trough where before you were at your peak uh yeah i often asked myself what is it about these individuals now one of the people that she that there were among her her chosen ones we shall call her that was very tight with me we were very very close it's this one girl that when i started out at the, in the organization she became we became fast friends because we, we you know one of those people that you meet you've never known them in your life but when you meet them you find out that they've known almost everyone in your life they've frequented the same circles her boyfriend was my boyfriend's friend uh but i'd never met her you know um but that's only because it, it's one of those friends that you only see once a year or whatever um yeah so we became really close because of our ecosystems what we both came from what we understood the lives we grew up with the things we could relate with the environments we'd been uh, to in the past places we'd frequented so we just kind of like hit it off straight away and so our, our relationship was strong uh and we we became close friends and i knew she was yeah i knew her personality i knew her in and out we used to talk about deep things and shallow things whatever so granted that i knew the personality of this colleague that became a friend right for me it was like okay but i know let's say this colleague's name was rara okay um i know rara <laughs> and i know rara quite well now after because I, I used to work for my company for five years i know quite rara for, for uh, quite well now at this stage i mean it's been a couple of years since i'd known her um i know more or less the the the, per, the ebb and the flow of her personality what takes her off what doesn't what puts her on a pedestal and what like you know wrenches her off it so rara and i are similar rara and i were similar in the worst way that's why i guess we got along like a house on fire you know birds of a feather type thing they flock together that was me and rara so i was very similar to rara the only diff thing that was different between rara and i was if we just looked outwardly different but otherwise you know we in in an inside we were really like truly more or less the same thing so i was like i kind of ooze the same energy as rara how is it that she's such fast friends with rara but she can't stand me and no not just me but like 95 percent of the individuals that frequent her general environment what is it about me and 95 percent of us that is just just not quite present you know that dwells richly and in abundance in rara that makes this woman n consistent with rara that was a, a thing that i was scratching my head concerning for years I, I knew this chick for years i was working for that company for years all right um i, I would just wonder 
What is this big thing that is so lovable about Rara that we don't have? That's just the thing about being an individual that cares about the opinions of men, that cares about how people feel, what they think, that minds their psychology generally, what's going on in there. Very intrigued by it, consider considering the mystery of humanity, something worthy of study. I've never been one of those people to ever subscribe to that doctrine that I don't care what people think about me or I don't care what people say or do about me concerning me i don't care that's why my comment my comments section on youtube is um sealed shut that is why i have disabled comments because i don't know how people do it i thoroughly do not know how they do it but to just kind of brush off a lot of exorbitant vitriol from complete strangers is just for the life of me i don't know how they take it in their stride perhaps i'm like super sensitive but then again i am created in the image of god and there is something that i got going down for myself that i'm very grateful to god for as opposed to upset that he made that um about me uh and that thing is just a baseline acceptance of how it is that I've been created constitutionally, what my general emotional climate is and my psychological, mental, whatever climate is. I've just accepted that it operates and it's wired a particular way. It is a baseline. It is foundationally just that way. And I, ever since coming to Christ anyway, have not cared to change it. Have not cared to change it. So human beings are born with a desire for affection. Human beings are born with a desire for acceptance. Human uh, affiliation, just to belong to a group and to be called one of them. So that's why we make friends in school when we get there so we can fit and feel like we're all right. Feel ensconced by yet other people who embrace you as acceptable in their niche all right people are born to desire relationship and that is a default setting that has been created by an omnipotent god who is a decisive in how it is that he will fashion a human being and he hasn't changed his mind he has not changed his mind for he is not a man that he should like nor son a man to change his mind therefore this default setting um in a world however that is fallen can be uncomfortable to walk with but it is there we are born naturally desirous of affection and so because we are born naturally and to also fit into some kind of a group and because of that it's just basic anthropology okay because of that it will always sting it will always hurt when someone rejects you especially somebody that you have um first embraced with a smile first embraced with an open arm first embraced with a, a you know a way about yourself that suggests look we could do this for life let's run together into the sunset you and i Yes, that rejection is poignant. It hurts. Okay, it is a dagger when it stabs you. Not even a prick like a pin, but a dagger. But humanity, right? We fell. We fell. If Adam and Eve did not fall, then this would not be so much of an issue at all, because we just get that we're not supposed to be animals towards each other. We are not supposed to be classist mindseted, or even walking around these streets anticipating ourselves in a position to ignore anybody or to treat anybody like they're lesser. But we fell, and so we are corrupted by sin. And as a result of that, we are sadistic at the very core. We are sadistic. Sadism is the very act of gaining pleasure out of people's pain. Now, why would you want pain for another human being? Well, feelings that come with the fall inside the human being involve such as anger, uh, irritation, um, jealousy, whatever it is that is a negative emotion that you can feel. And there are coping mechanisms psychologically that people come up with to deal with fear, with anger, with jealousy, with strivings and side stirrings, uh, whatever might be, like, you know, whatever negative emotion there might be. As people, just so we can get to the, uh, the next day and the next day with these funny feelings, we find a way to make ourselves feel better for them so in your sinful state that is fallen that therefore thanks to it being fallen can thus feel jealousy sometimes the coping mechanism to deal with that jealousy is to treat the object of your jealousy or resentment or wrath or anger with hostility even if they have not had it coming even if they have not warranted it or earned it in any way it is your way of basically shooting dead what you anticipate to be the threat coming from them it's a pretty girl in the room you envy her 
that envy is a war ring with you internally. So in order to make yourself feel better, you shoot it down. You massacre it as a means of survival by acting a particular way towards the object of your envy. Not object, subject. Towards the subject of your envy. You, re you respond by shooting it dead in the heart. But your response is, of course, I'm jealous, so I'm gonna ignore you. I'm jealous, so I'm gonna bully you. I'm jealous, so I'm gonna be mean. I'm jealous, so every single time you speak i'm going to laugh like what you're saying is rubbish i'm gonna break you so i can feel better when you're down i'm gonna squash you on the floor like bubble gum under my shoe and then when you're there i'm gonna walk a whole bunch so you can keep on getting muddy muddied by the soil and then if i feel a little guilty i might just scrape you off but understand since you are bubble gum under my shoe i will throw you in a bin but at least you're sitting comfortably in a smelly environment as opposed to being constantly stepped on by my shoe that is the reaction of the human race to the uncomfortable feelings that they have about other people even if they're unwarranted the bible says anger is overwhelming but fury is a flood but who and fury is a flood but who can stand before jealousy who can stand before jealousy so essentially jealousy is this thing that is a, a beast on its own it has a life of its own it has a, a, a mutation of its own if it was a virus it would be a superbug do you understand in comparison even to anger and fury all right and those who do not bring it those who do not exercise self-control over it uh, man oh man how it is that they can commit some of the most abominable things how they can shatter the very core of humanity that makes us wholesome the very thing that makes us a going concern a thriving thing that the Lord has seen it fit to just allow to linger for another day and then another year and then another century and then another millennium but you see things are gonna come to a blistering end when people allow their sin to fester so for effervescently without exercising any self-control over those sins that they will basically then create out of this planet a frankly an insufferable environment because anywhere where human beings are at where there is no acceptance where there is no love adoration where there is no fostering of communities and the feeding of the embitterment of those communities where there is no building but nothing but just breaking down structures there's nothing left for us to do anymore here it has taken a mighty 6,000 years to get them. I don't care whether you believe in the Big Bang Theory. I am not a scientist, but I am also not dumb enough to think that nothing created us all, okay? Uh, I am running with what it is that the Bible says, and so according to the scriptures, this joint has been around 6,000 years. If you're happy to click off me because I just said that, because you think of me as a flat earther, do you? Do you? Disperse. Because at the end of the day, this content that I am creating is for the tribulation bunch of people that will hear me speak, so I doubt they'll be too arrogant about it. The earth has been around 6,000 years, more or less. The Lord's number of completion is seven, and so anything with a seven in it, understand, is a finality. There will be a seven-year tribulation, and there will be seven 7,000 years of the Earth's existence in totality, and we are about to enter into the last 1,000. Do you understand? In the millennial reign. So with the 6,000 years that it's taken for us to walk up and down this Earth, all right, with all of those 6,000 years, we have prospered in that time uh, to dwindle ourselves away. Just a little bit of a caveat and a side note, eh? To uh, substantiate the 6,000 years that we've been here, as opposed to the mil millions that the human race claims we've been around. Uh, listen now, from whatever time these, uh, the, the, these, um, what do they call them? Theoretical physicists? Mm. From around the time that we existed as human beings. So no, not the monkey era or the Neanderthal era, the whatever. Yeah, basically the Homo sapien era, okay? From the time the Homo sapiens commenced, when, whenever that is, I don't take too much time out of my schedule to study um, the facts of this world, which aren't really facts, but whatever. I rather study what the scriptures say and I just run with it. Like, it's called faith, all right? So how however many uh, millions of years we've been around how long do they claim human beings have been around whatever it's likely more than six thousand years that they claim right yeah that number <sighs> people human beings uh only just look at recorded history and the ways of humanity in it and how much we have so decimated every ecosystem we can ever walk in what makes you think however many years they claim we've been around my my computer is actually uh open so i just want to go and find the number okay i'll be back hi i have returned huh so according to Google, some article there, um, fossils and DNA suggest people looking like us anatomically modern homo sapiens evolved around, wait for it, drum roll, 
300,000 years ago, whatever, okay. 300,000 years ago, allegedly, apparently, we have been around, or at least people looking like us, so I suspect maybe even Neanderthals, whatever. 300,000 years ago. Only look at the past 1,000 years. Within those 1,000 years, there has been a man in existence by the name of Hitler that holocausted the living dealers out of the Jews. Only look at the moral turpitude of the human race, the general decline of common decency over the past 1,000 years, never mind two, three, six thousand, let alone three hundred thousand. What do you think people would have done? This intelligent species walking around called human beings in three hundred thousand years. Apparently, we've got a problem right now with climate change, where it is that the human beings, the human race is responsible. Human caused climate change thanks to our carbon emissions, our fossil fuels, our etc. whatever. Okay, methane gas farted by cows in the Netherlands. They allegedly have contributed to why it is that our planet it is basically falling apart and there is nowhere under heaven that we can find help it is presently very scorching in south africa and it has not rained for as scorching as it is it has not rained all of september and whatever little bit of sliver of, of, of october might exist and for me that is an abnormality an anomaly that i have witnessed observed myself i've noticed because spring the beginning of it september usually is very rainy and i spoke about that um like in previous videos according to many of these global elites that's because of us we did it okay we did that we have uh, participated or contributed to global warming and famines droughts all different kinds of natural disasters so if we could destroy the planet like the earth never mind each other's hearts never mind breaking each other's hearts but if we could break the heart's earth the, uh, the earth's heart if we could break what you call mother nature then how in the world under heaven do you anticipate we've been around three hundred thousand years minimum at a minimum we would have decimated this environment <laughs> in year in like six thousand pretty much it would have taken us about five to six to seven thousand years to bring the earth to this level of climate change chaos we would have innovated and innovated our way out of the earth we would have swept ourselves off the planet we would have done it we are destructive we are fallen and so as a result all we do is destroy we are debased we are born dead in trespasses and sins and all we can do is decimate we do not think for our fellow man we're defeatist we don't have a concept of camaraderie or at least we ought to have a better one than we presently have we don't hold hands we're defeatist in the worst way i believe i've already used that word we shoot ourselves in the foot out of nothing but selfish ambition unable entirely to think for the future to think in foresight as to what the potential ramifications of my actions might be if I do this and that. You've seen it in corporate, goodness, you don't even have to go on an anthropological, like, geographical location type, like, escapade in order to figure out what's going on. Just go inside whatever 9 to 5 environment, corporate brick and mortar structure that you clock into every single morning to do your job. Only look at the defeatism of colleagues in the spirit of competition. Look at how they fever to be number one one will cause them to deliberately disregard whatever the executive suite's decision for the company's goals whatever the value proposition for the organization might be look at how they disregard all that just so they can be the one to get ahead they will disregard excellent ideas from fellow colleagues lest they should get noticed they will disregard excellent work done by colleagues lest they should get noticed all in the spirit of competition so whatever the ceo says this is what we're trying to do this year rarely ever do people ever meet it with like a perfectly matched traceability matrix and the reason for that is because people are ever in the business of shooting themselves in the foot so when an organization gets liquidated for the better part of the time it has been random individuals on the ground that contributed chipped away at the walls of this company over very many years with their defeatism so if random john and random jane and random john and jane doe because they're both dead if they could kill a whole thriving going concern and a, 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 a corporate if they could kill a fortune 500 company like over like the span of five ten years what in the world can we do to an earth over three hundred thousand years apparently according to these global elites we have brought the earth to basically its knees the planet is at our mercy and we need to stop to a point where they now want to surveil the living daylights out of us and control everything we do lest we should cause the earth to suffocate further hmm? we have got a whole bunch of people 
on a mega on a megalomaniacal like rampage attempting to take away all of our freedoms as human beings because apparently we're destroying the earth that we live in and we have for a prosper to do that in just a meager little couple of hundred years climate change was not the issue that it presently is today uh goodness 200 years ago 300 years ago just like the previous millennium it was not so bad i mean we're, we're in the new millennium right now like 2000 the year 2000 was not so long ago it happened literally just 22 years ago so this is basically the fresh millennium that we're in right now um we just have to go just a little bit like drive a little bit into the previous millennium go into the 20th century and it is not, not millennium sorry well that too i guess you could call it a millennium but even the, the last century go into that century and the issues that we presently have with climate change are just not there in the early part of that century let alone the millennium it was not that big an issue for us to sneeze or to exhale too much carbon dioxide just 200 years ago and now it is so what under heaven since we are so destructive with all of the uh, technology we keep on innovating with all of the radiation we keep on like giving cancer to people using with all of that if we could destroy it in such a tiny little amount of time what could an intelligent homo sapien species worth of bustling beings do 300 years of time given them what could they possibly potentially do these things are debunkable with just basic common sense human beings are destructive they're destructive because we are fallen they are defeatist their sinful nature makes them uncomfortable to just do what is normal they adore to go against the right thing and so for those reasons there's no way we could have been around for 300,000 years purely because we're fallen we would have found a way to destroy this in my country there was this like whole saying that Motomontoa is saying yeah that basically means that a black person just devastates destroys everywhere they go and no this is not created by white people or indian people or anybody else out of the black demographic it's black folk who come to that acknowledgement the reason why they say that is because after apartheid ended that was that uh systematic oppression that uh, oppressive regime of long ago when it ended and the group areas act which basically said that black people have to live in a particular place indian people white people they all have their own spots on the on the country in the country to live in since all that was repealed it meant that black people could now influx into previously white neighborhoods there was this uh, neighborhood that is called Yeovil and it's close to downtown Joburg it's it's somewhere it's in the center it's in it's in Joburg it's not in the central center center of Joburg but it's pretty close right it's called Berea it's called Yeovil it is called Hillbrow right that neighborhood was historically white and quite affluent it's close if anything to Houghton which is where Nelson Mandela used to live okay yeah understand that it was a middle class um, to upper middle class neighborhood that was teeming at the falls of course back in the days of apartheid with white people it was a white suburb they were white suburbs Hillbro, Berea, Yeovil that whole joint it was a white suburb they were white suburbs all right um it's made up of a whole bunch of sessional titles flats skyscrapers going all the way up and up up to the ceiling of the earth mm, yeah well uh after apartheid ended the closest to soweto uh, that would be the closest to black townships right uh, environment that they could like migrate to was yeovil because like i said it is in the center of joburg so if at all you're coming from the various uh, if you're coming from the west the east the south the north uh, of the group areas act regions if you were coming from togoza your center your center point was johannesburg downtown joburg the cbd if you're coming from soweto that was your you know what i mean if you were coming from um, like uh, give me oh you get my point if at all it was a a, a, a gassi a township um this the, the the fastest place the easiest place that you could find yourself at as quickly as you possibly can move to with your bed and your like fridge and everything it was the cbd and since these areas were close to central Johannesburg, uh, to the CBD, where it is that, you know, you had to flail your dompas just to be there, type establishment thing. Yeah, they moved there. They moved there. And when they moved there, um, it's almost as though they were awarding off, like, a little bit of a, a fumigator for white people. White people left as soon as black people came in. And then black people populated that environment. I mean, come on. It's... A, a, a reasonable sectional title it's a flat it's got a you know a, a bedroom it has got a lounge it's got a kitchen it's a house just sit there and keep it well like clean do what you need to do and maintain your property now that you're living there okay now that you're renting there just like keep yourself in a neat bunch they have since then in these meager 30 some years ever since apartheid was repealed managed to debilitate Beria, Yeovil and um what is the other one Hilbro they have decimated 
created it. Do you understand? It is uninhabitable today by anybody at all that cares for their hygiene. You go to any flat in downtown Choburg, belonging to anybody really, in Yeovil, Beria, and there are like cockroaches just kind of walking by while people eat dinner, and they will splash, th splash them against the wall with their bare hands, and not be disquieted that you've literally just touched a cockroach. Like it's bad, debilitated, and it didn't even take 30 years. Within the first five to ten years when black people moved in there, they just destroyed it. They decimated it. What is it then that is so destructive? Black people are the ones that confess themselves that eh, rasinga, moriang ting rasinga, litter. Hosinga is to destroy. Litter is yes, like it, like all different kinds of Coca Cola cans, banana peels that are just thrown outside windows, and you just expect somebody to come and pick it up. So it smells. It smells not only of a garbage, just generally as you walk around, but also urine. So people just pee on walls like men you know they just love to whip it out and do their thing right there and then without looking for a bathroom whatever yeah no stuff like that so it is a very unpleasant environment to be in and those who live there have just kind of taken it in their stride that this is my current condition because I don't have money to afford anything better so at least I've got a roof over my head but it is in shambles shambles all the projects that the government has embarked on to try and gentrify uh, again downtown Joburg those buildings end up uh, like ransacked again um, in Auckland Park not far from some company that I used to work for they tried to hook up these like young professional apartments that were luxury and you know like on some we're trying to gentrify Johannesburg we're trying to beautify it again we're trying to bring back its life its pulse its heartbeat again and within four years it was a ravaged building it was nasty you could not like they were beautiful when they were first started but within four years it's not the kind of environment that if you're a little bit of a snob you would allow yourself to go and live there so there are just certain places that are essentially unrehabilitable so what what did that in black people what what did that in us in us that when we move to a new area as a horde we just kind of like you know decimate you know what did that lack loss and want it's written in God's Word but if you take a poor man and you make him rich overnight rags to riches without any training without any like you know running them through the modes and helping them understand the rules they will become the bane of the existence basically of the ecosystem the environment a peasant that becomes a king overnight the earth cannot bear up under him and black people inherited these houses that were previously owned by very privileged people who from long ago had been using the skills of black people to keep their houses clean to build their skyscrapers to build their houses to mow their lawns to um what is this caretake their properties like pick up shrubs like there is no single demographic at least in south africa that is not that, that, that cleans more than black people we are if at all anybody has a domestic worker it's usually a black woman if anybody has a gardener it's usually a black man if anybody has got a painter it's usually a black man if anybody has got a brick layer it's usually a black man so these people know how to build and they know how to clean and they know how to keep an environment how to, how to make it basically luxury however strangely when it belongs to them they just massacre it they just destroy it they can build a builder can build a beautiful house for an indian family a white man and then go and like literally crack apart his own walls what does that in black people given that we're the ones that are scrubbing everybody's floors and yet our own floors are dirty why would you do that in your own backyard whereas you would go and make clean another individual's backyard oppression abuse affliction for very many years has a way about causing a person to think that it's okay for them to live in their own dung while essentially making like toilet paper on the buttocks of everybody else and so thanks to that level of harassment of black people without like adequately I guess a training them up as to how to basically live in a gentrified and environment thanks to that black people are now basically now that they are living in the very properties that they historically built but now they're living there they then destroy them because they don't have that concept within themselves or at least a whole bunch of them to not destroy where it is that you're at we were handed down some of the most debilitated environments to live in during the group areas act we were given the worst of the worst the worst electrical infrastructure the worst water supply uh, plumbing plumbing structure the worst streets if at all there were any streets it was mostly gravel the the worst um, materials building materials for our houses the worst this the worst that the worst that so that's why you will find in any township at all that we've got these like little rondavels these little little mud huts that don't have bathrooms or trailers that are outside or whatever in black communities group areas act say it, you're gonna live in such an environment as this so they've been handed down scraps and so everywhere they go they continue to live in a scraps type mentality and a mindset so you might
might be tempted to be like black people are dirty and they don't make a sense and everywhere they go they destroy making like penny sparrow lamenting against black folk on at durban beach and so trending on social media you might be tempted to say that but there is a history behind why they're even the way that they are and that history is yet more human sin that went and grabbed certain people in the human race and made out of them mops on the floor that clean up everybody else's vomit and so therefore now that they're mops on the floor all they know is the stench of vomit and so everywhere they go is muddy their environment with the stench of vomit so everything if you backtrack and backtrack all the ailments basically societal ails that we have as the human race they can be traced back to some kind of sin some kind of sin so yes i don't disagree black people by a mosha they destroy but they have become little destroyers because of yet additional first come first served destroyers the originator the genome that was the, the spark in the starter of a destroyer and no i'm not about to say white man i'm about to say sin sin do you understand it went inside us and we decided to like hook up little segregations we decided to come up with silos we decided that we are going to be defeatist we are going to go and create out of people a workforce do you understand while we sit around leisurely as somebody sweeps right there by my feet causing a grand grand underestimation of certain people groups over others and so now the result is there's nothing we can do every attempt that the human race embarks on to try and correct a situation is like practically it, it's basically putting a band-aid on cancer or spraying cologne on a corpse we can't fix it it is ramification upon ramification and stacks upon stacks of it when then black people start to become a little less destructive hmm? now we can live in suburbia without like breaking apart our like apartment buildings or whatever now you can find a, a reasonably decent properties in four ways where black people are living in their numbers and they're not destroying it so it turns out ha ah, ha ah, they can be taught right since they considered us like little animals they can be taught but now that they can successfully keep a house well without destroying it because you know years have progressed and they've been nicely gentrified now there is another sin creeping up in their hearts and it's called classism like when does it stop whoa when does it stop now it's classism so while you can keep your beautiful apartment in morningside santon looking stella like a white person in 19 like 58 there in the suburbs of whatever city you might be dwelling in in south africa in the days of apartheid while you can keep your house looking like that without people then being like how typical you are a black person now you just have an attitude problem now you just think like now you look down on your neighbor now you look down on those very people still living in hillbrook because they can't afford an apartment in four ways now you treat individuals that have got a certain salary like they in jack because it is nothing in comparison to your lofty one over there because you're an md now because you're a ceo now because you're an apple middle management now now they, they 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 have got an attitude issue they they it's goodness gracious like just character flaws from here to timbuktu so it's like there's no end to what it is that human beings can do to rot themselves away we we do away with all of the trouble and the tumult that we experienced as a people historically that wanted to interracially date interracially marry we've come a long way to overwhelm societal pressure to stick within your race and so now today you look on social media and it is littered about colorfully so with all of these interracial couples and you're like oh my goodness yes we've come a long way but alongside that acceptance culture alongside that adoption culture of things that historically were very taboo alongside the shunning of racism you know beautiful good stuff is then the fact that there is this like sexual revolution where now because you can date across races without get, being given too much of a hard time you've got an asian boyfriend today and tomorrow you've got a white boyfriend you're experimenting playing russian playing russian roulette with all the races in this world while allowing your nether regions to be this like random thing that's constantly being rammed into by i've got these i've got these in different area codes as if though that was not already a problem but in 2022 everybody is sleeping with an asian everybody is sleeping with a white man everybody is sleeping with a black girl everybody is sleeping with like a puerto rican a mexican everybody has got a boyfriend or a girlfriend from all different kinds of races and it's so much fun because then you get to have like a rainbow color in your bed it's like we, we can never catch a break to understand as the human race because we keep on chipping away at ourselves there is just so much sin and then with all of this increase of uh sexual immorality on the ground is then an increase in like diseases right yeah venereal diseases that are dwelling in an eco in an environment 
in the medical sciences where there's so much technology to cure them or deal with them or at least put them to bed so they're not so destructive hey you've got hepatitis c and hiv all at the same time but guess what you're living to the ripe old age of 95 because of arvs on all different kinds of treatment and so because you're getting this treatment you then decide to like spread the virus and then go on telling everybody but hiv since it is <sighs> About two years ago, I was watching something on TV, not so much on YouTube. And there was this one girl that looked like she could be in university, about 20, maybe 19 years of age. And she was interviewed on this talk show. And she basically said something so taboo. And yet nobody in this like audience was like, <gasps> type establishment thing. And I don't know why nobody was shocked. And the thing that she said was, HIV is no longer the death sentence that it used to be. So I don't get what the big deal is when you're HIV positive. I'm sorry, no, it is still a big deal kids no longer think it's that bad or that taboo to be hiv positive because no longer do you contract it and have like literally just maximum five years to live you can get to a ripe old age some people can even get married and have children hiv positive there's so much technology so what then do they do i don't want to be the only one i don't want to be the only one i was watching the testimony of some of a christian woman who got given hiv because she compromised sexually she was celibate for very many years and decided that she's been waiting for too long a lot a man to come into her life they did not use a condom and she contracted hiv just like that like this we broke your virginity and with the first guy that you've ever been with you get it and all along you were waiting on the lord but then you got tired and sick and tired you were sick and tired and waiting on the lord and this chick spoke about how it is that this dude was so healthy he was thriving he was so vivacious like for the life of you you would not be able to tell and she was with him for quite a while before they first and foremost did it and then quite a while before they even stopped using protection and she, this dude apparently allegedly loved her so much and acted really well good towards her that she could never uh, mistrust him to uh, give her deliberately a disease of this uh i'd say by knowing that he was sick and it turns out that he knew he it turned out that he knew that he was sick all along and for him it was like but i don't want to be the only one with this i want to get married i want to get married i want to have children i found that i'm hiv when i'm um, i was still too young and a whole bunch of women rejected me because of it so i mean i wanted to get married so he just didn't tell her he just didn't tell her and then gave it to her in the name of but i still love you though i love you we i mean come on it's not the death sentence that it used to be so here it is that now you have got this like permanent illness for which you have to take chronic medication and somebody has given it to you and they don't think it's such a big deal because well come on it's not like you're gonna die you know just keep taking your meds just keep taking your meds so when people innovate solutions for the venereal diseases that everybody keeps on getting instead of realizing that oh my goodness like dodged that bullet i nearly died in just five years after contracting full blown, blown aids instead of lessons being learned what then they make a decision to do is not want to be the only one with hepatitis c you don't want to be the only one with hiv don't want to be the only one with hpv you don't want to be the only one with gonorrhea you don't want to be the only one you don't want to be the only one and there's enough medication to go around for all of us to feed us with it so that even if you get it it's not like i've killed you it's not even that much of a culpable homicide case and so they're spreading it it turns out there is no amount of grace that can be given the human race that will cause them to realize that we're under judgment we need to stop we're under judgment we need to stop there is no grace because it was grace frankly from god it is the glory of god to conceal a matter and the glory of man to search it out it was grace from god to give the human race medical technology to overcome the deadliness of hiv slash AIDS. It was his mercy so that you could come around and repent now that you have been punished for your sexual sin. Instead of repenting, the medical technology made them more promiscuous and it caused them to try and paint the whole of the earth red with HIV. There is nothing that the human race cannot continue to do in a wicked capacity. We just keep on ravaging every environment that